Well, praise the Lord. Tonight we continue our studies concerning things that overcomers will avoid. And I trust you're up to date that we have looked at one thing overcomers will avoid is the I infirmity of institutional religion, where everyone is always saying, I believe this or that, and I believe that I'm right and the minister's wrong. Then we saw, too, how that we are to avoid the substitution of man attitudes for the beatitudes where we superimpose man's word upon God's word. And then thirdly, the last time we were to avoid the snare of good intentions. We saw that good intentions are not enough. And now tonight, we as overcomers will avoid compromising the word of God because we will always tell it like it is. Tell it like it is. The theme of our study tonight is not designed to teach you how to lose friends or alienate people <laughs> by telling it like it is, but since God expects overcomers to be honest and truthful and without deceit, then sometimes it will have this effect if you tell it like it is. Now, you know, it's interesting that voters expect the politicians to tell it like it is. Their position, their beliefs, and the youth today are free in their expressions. They express themselves freely, and they speak freely and openly, and they believe they say in telling it like it is. And parents want the teachers to tell it like it is, and everything from driver's ed to sex ed, so they can escape that responsibility. And the sick want the doctors to tell it like it is. But I found in the spiritual realm, and you already know what's coming, in the spiritual realm, if you tell sinners they need to repent or perish, or the church of our day, they need once more to preach a full gospel, or need to preach a full gospel, need the Holy Spirit to be effective, then no one, voters, youth, parents, sick, church members, want you to tell it like it is. No, in fact you'll find that the attitude of the church toward the Holy Spirit and divine healing and faith is the same as the world's attitude toward the message against sin. As often as not, they hate both the message and the messenger. I'd like to divide our study tonight into two parts, and the first part is what telling it like it is isn't. If you can put all that together in your mind, what telling it like it is isn't. And then we'll see what it is. And, of course, if you don't want to write telling it like it is all the time, you can just do like I do if I make an outline, T-L-I-I, -I, telling it like it is. It's a lot simpler. But be that as it may, first of all, what telling it like it is isn't, it isn't telling all you know, unless you want to get into trouble a lot of times. Now, Jesus never told all he knew all the time. You'll find that without us looking up the passages in Luke 13, I believe, verse 23 and following. And in John 19, 9, where Jesus did not always tell all he knew. He always told things like they were. He would tell it like it is, but he didn't always tell all he knew. I mean, if your hostess invites you over for dinner... You don't tell her her biscuits look and taste like hockey pucks, <laughs> even though they may. Nor, if you want to keep your job, would you tell your employer's wife that that dress she spent two months making by hand looks like something that you saw some wearing on trick-or-treat night. <laughs> so you don't always tell all you know, or all you think you know. In fact, what telling it like it is isn't, also means that sometimes you don't tell anything you know. You just remain silent. In Matthew 7, 6, Jesus said, sometimes don't tell anything. He said, don't give that which is holy unto dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. There are cases where we don't tell anything we know if you're wise, because they'll just turn and trample truth that you gave them under their feet and rend you. Now, this is a good principle to keep in mind. Let's use an example of when you don't tell anything you know, and I think, again, you ought to know what's coming. 
This is a good principle to use concerning the media who will lie and tell you they want to hear your side. We just want to be fair. We want to hear your side so we can present it too. And then they'll trample what you told them under their feet and turn and rend you. They will lie. They will criticize. They'll publish slander and ridicule, twisting the statements that you made. Now, you know this is a fact. We had that recently happen here where a person actually came into this church acted as if he were a friend of the church and anti-media and anti-extreme medical treatment and all of that and then turned around and published everything contrary to what he saw and heard here and said himself that he believed. Now that's a case of where you don't want to tell anything you know. And of course we didn't tell him anything we knew. It was just a case of, well, I don't even want to digress to go into it, but if he's an example of a friend, we don't need any enemies. We've got all the enemies we need in our friends. But nevertheless, without going into detail, it was a case of a former student talking to the former professor of his and acting like he was sympathetic toward the church and the abuse of the media on us and all, and then turned around and actually was more damaging because it was coming from a religious source. But Everything the media reports is twisted and slanderous. It is slanted toward liberalism, anti-truth. It's anti-Christ. And even when someone like that tries to be religious, it isn't scriptural, what they say. Even when they set themselves up as a religious reporter, they're not scriptural. I mean, you ought to be able to figure out that a non-charismatic cannot report charismatic truth and events and experiences. That's like an infidel trying to teach us about God in the Bible. You see, it's out of his realm of experience. And so unless you are charismatic, you can't pronounce on charismatic matters. Well, a lot of material is coming now through the media itself about the irresponsibility of the media. I just have a few things here that's come across my desk, like the myth, M-Y-T-H, the myth of the neutrality in the media. There's no such thing as a neutral media, though they profess to be. Here's another one that journalism, the media, is under fire. And it goes on to show this long report in one of the news magazines that only 13% of the people have any confidence in the media. The medical profession, 52% of the people had confidence. That leaves about 48% that don't. That includes us. Scientific community, they have about 44% confidence in the secular education, teaching and all, 29%. Only 29% of the people have confidence in secular educators, and yet they are constantly sending them to those. The U.S. Supreme Court, 28% of the people, only 28% had any confidence. Banks, 24%. The press, 13.1%. It's rated about the same as television. People don't have any confidence in that. Then here's another article, alcohol and drug abuse problems in the newsrooms. And it goes on to show that these problems among the mediaites, the news people and so forth, reporters, there are problems with alcoholism and drug addiction. Now, anyone ought to be able to figure out that if they cannot cope with their own lives, in fact, it's a problem. It says that alcohol and drug abuse reached epidemic proportions among the media. So how reliable would there be about anything they say if they can't cope with their own lives? You know, a person becomes an alcoholic or a drug addict because they can't cope. And so how reliable is that? And then here's another. We're talking about sometimes you don't tell anything you know, and the media is a good example. Here was a group of editors in a large city, large newspapers, talking about the media and reporting and all. And so one of the questions was concerning how they get their recruits for reporters and so forth. And here's what one said. We hire, and this is true of all the papers, obviously, we hire 20 to 23-year-old youth, 20 to 23 years old, who have no experience. They cannot write. We have to teach them how to write. So we send these youth out to get the story and write it up. And then you wonder why there's such a mess and such inaccurate reporting in the media. 
that these large papers up in a city near us said that they hired 20 to 23 year olds who have no experience, they don't even know how to write. Well, I could have told them that. But. <laughs> and so telling it like it is means, first of all, that you don't tell all you know, but if you're dealing with the media, you never tell anything you know. Not if you want to be a part of the end time move of God. You'll learn quickly that they'll never report it the way you stated it. Not even your name. They'll get it backwards or misspell it. And secondly, telling it like it is what it isn't. Telling it like it is does not mean telling people off. You see, telling it like it is, some people think means to tell people off. You hear Christians say, well, he was wrong or she was wrong and I just wanted to set the record straight. They needed to be straightened out. Have you ever said that? Well, there are two types of people in this category I want to mention of those who like to tell people off, and I'm talking about professing Christians now. First of all, those who allow others to upset them to the point that they believe they have to go straighten them out. And then, secondly, we'll see there are those who allow others to upset them to the point of them getting angry or flying into a rage or actually taking some sort of action against the people that upset them. So there are two types of people that think telling it like it is, you know, being honest, being open, being frank, is to tell people off. Those who allow others to upset them to the point they have to go straighten them out, they have to set the record straight. And sometimes you see, instead of praying as you should do for the other, let me just say, keep a balance here because the scriptures do say we are to admonish our brother and sister at times. There's a place for that. But we're not talking about that aspect. We've mentioned that before. But we're talking tonight about what telling it like it is isn't. And it isn't getting your nose into somebody else's business instead of praying for a person. I've had this happen to me. People will intrude into your personal life or your family life or they'll tell you how to conduct your ministry. And so I'm saying, telling it like it is does not mean you have to keep people straight. You always have to get them straightened out. And there are people like that. I've been in meetings where, well, like in one case, a young man came up. And by the way, all the time, except one time, it's been the youth. And it's this idea of being open and frank and that you know more than your elders and so forth. It's just in the atmosphere, I guess, because I've seen it more today than I ever have in all of my years. But he came up and said, you should not mention non-charismatics in your meeting. I had addressed myself in a faith teaching or maybe on the baptism of the Holy Spirit or whatever about non-charismatics will need the baptism in order to be empowered and fulfill the commission or whatever. So he rushed up right after and said, you shouldn't mention non-charismatics because there were some here tonight. And you no doubt offended them and they probably won't be back. We well, see, I only used a term I could have called them people without the baptism of the Holy Spirit or whatever. But there he thought he had to straighten me out. And I thought, what presumption? Here he's about 21, 22 years old. First time he's ever heard me. He doesn't know where I'm coming from except that one message. And yet he feels it's his duty and obligation to go get that person told what's right or what they need to hear. In another case... When I was teaching on the deeper life, a Canadian who was down in the meeting in Minnesota where I was teaching, he came after I was teaching on my book, Deeper Life in the Spirit, or on that subject, and he said, I don't think you should mention overcomers because that will cause some to think that they're not as spiritual as they should be if they think there's a group of overcomers over here who are dying out to sell. <laughs> well, I said, that's right. It will probably cause them to think they're not as spiritual as they ought to be. I said both the term and the teachings right out of the Bible, but he wanted me to be quiet about that. And then in another case, I shouldn't teach on the abundant life. And all of these are young men, you see. I shouldn't be teaching on the abundant life. Well, I said it's in the Bible. I said I didn't write it, and there it is. Here's what Jesus said, you know, in Mark 10 or Matthew 6.33, Philippians 4.19. I said it's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, we're going to teach it. And so there are always those who feel like they have to get people straightened out, and that is telling it like it is. You know, you're being honest, you're being open, and you're being frank, but you're also being a nuisance. <laughs> I said there are two categories under this heading, and there are those who allow people to upset them to the point that they get angry, fly into a rage, and so forth. 
and are not even Christian in their spirit. I was up at Goshen College. I don't mind telling you where it is because they're always telling about us here. They even notified way over in India some parents that their daughter was attending this church and that we were real bad people because we believe in divine healing and faith. But anyway, I was speaking up there some years ago on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and one student couldn't wait to get up to me before I left to tell me he didn't agree, and he practically shouted in my face that the fruits are more important than the gifts, you know, healing and whatever. The fruits are more important than the gifts. Well, I could have told him there were several of the fruits that he wasn't manifesting toward me, <laughs> like love and long-suffering or whatever. And I read recently where a restaurant owner disliked something that his cook did. He drank his coffee out of a saucer. You ever seen people do that? Pour it out in a saucer, blow it, and sip it. All that really bothered him. This is a true story. It was a true book. And that really upset the owner, and he would catch him doing it and fly into a rage. And so one time, the writer of the book said he saw him doing it again, and he went and got his gun from under the counter and started chasing him around the restaurant with a gun and dropped dead of a heart attack. And so doctors, you know, they know that. They know that ulcers are caused not only by something that you ate, but something you hate. And so you have to be careful about not thinking that being honest and open and free and above board is to tell people off. And some people really get upset, you know. Some deluded ministers, we've mentioned this before, follow the advice of the secular psychiatrists who tell you to express your rage or your anger toward others and get it off your chest because that's the way to avoid ulcers or heart attacks is to get it off your chest and tell people off. Well, as we mentioned before, obviously ministers who teach that, that secular psychology, have never read the Word of God on the matter of anger, like in Genesis 4 where Abel was killed because of the anger of his brother, Numbers 14 where the Israelites were judged by God because of their anger against him and Moses. And 1 Corinthians 10, if you need a warning to the church, are Christians concerning anger. And then here is another statement. This person said, never waste time thinking about those you hate. He thought that was good advice, but Jesus said you don't hate even your enemies. And so it sounds like good advice not to waste your time thinking about those you hate so you don't get ulcers or coronary, but you're not supposed to be hating them anyway. Then thirdly, what telling it like it is isn't. Telling it like it is does not mean to debate. We have our fundamentalist friends here, but we can use a lot of people that are not classified capital F fundamentalists who love to debate the Word of God. I've found some misguided people think they can argue people into truth and into faith. And dear friends, you can't. You cannot argue people into faith. A good example is books written on Jonah trying to prove there's a fish out there in the ocean big enough with a throat large enough that it could swallow a man down. And they seem to be ignorant of the fact that if they just read the book of Jonah, it says in the last part of chapter 1 that God prepared a special fish to swallow up Jonah. Swallow up, that's the way it's translated, but you swallow up to swallow him down, but God prepared a fish. And even if they ever found a fish out there with a throat broad enough to swallow down a man whole, well, how in the world would he ever be able to exist in his stomach for three days? Because the gastric juices would turn him into hamburger before that. <laughs> and so we have to see that telling it like it is isn't debating with people. I wouldn't cross the street to debate if I knew I was going to win it because that's not what God has sent us to do. He sent us to deliver his word, not to debate it. Which reminds me of a popular minister who was holding a nationwide debate and I heard it on the radio. It was going to be on television, but he was announcing on the radio a nationwide television debate on evolution between an evolutionist and a creationist, a scientific creationist. And he was going to have this debate, he said, with the evolutionists and not use one verse out of the Bible to prove his point. Well, dear friends, you can't use the methods of the world in order to try to defeat the God of this world. It just won't work because you'll never convince the evolutionists anyway. You just won't. 
And then a Christian, you give him no biblical basis if you're not going to use Bible. You don't give him any biblical basis for believing in creationism, that is, special creation by God. And so he went on to say, I don't mind schools teaching evolution. Well, I do. I don't mind schools teaching evolution if they let us present creation. Well, I mind them teaching it. I mind them teaching anything that's out of line with the Word of God. But you're not going to convince an evolutionist by debate. And you can't convince a Christian that creation is true. And that's what he ought to hold to and believe if you're not going to quote the Word of God. Quote some scientific, philosophical syllogism, some scientific argument. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul there in Corinth, where all the philosophers were in Athens, using philosophical debate, debating with those philosophers? No, he preached the Word, and that was it. He said in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech or enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and in power. Can you imagine Jesus using philosophical reasoning or syllogisms with the devil when he said, cast yourself down from the pinnacle? The word of the Lord says, angels of the Lord will lift you up, bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And then everyone, when they see that miracle, will believe you. Jesus did not debate, but he said, thus it is written, Satan, and he would quote him the word of God. He didn't say in a syllogistic form, well, let's see, now heavier than air objects will fall due to the law of gravity, and I am a heavier than air object. Conclusion, why, Satan, I'm not going to cast myself down. I would fall and be killed. No, he didn't debate him. He just delivered the word of the Lord. Well, those are some of the things that it's not. Now, let's look tonight at what telling it like it is is what is it well first of all telling it like it is means you will witness to a full with the emphasis upon full gospel that means the whole word of God you will witness to a full gospel and you will keep your witness in line with the word of the Lord all the way from Genesis to Revelation you see, when God, by His grace, has given us a full revelation, and He has, from Genesis to Revelation, He's given us all we need to know to be saved and to help others find the way into the kingdom and to live a holy, separated life glorifying God in this world. So after He's given us a full gospel, then He expects us to speak that gospel, that is His word, without changing it, either its content, intent, or meaning, without compromising it, by watering it down, and without withholding any part of it. Now that is true whether or not you're dealing with healing or holiness, water baptism or spirit baptism, election or warnings against apostasy, non-charismatic errors or charismatic errors where they're to be found, like the JDS heresy. We're not to compromise, we're not to water it down, we're not to change it, not one jot, one tittle. Whether we're talking about begging for money or trusting God for finances, whether we're talking about total faith or total discipleship, whether we're talking about the crucified life or the abundant life. These are just some of the areas where churches are not telling it like it is in a lot of other areas. Let's use a couple of examples tonight where churches, Christians, are not telling it like it is in the area of healing and in the area of faith. And this will show you how that we are to tell it like it is, but most are not. Take the matter of healing. Now, is this woman telling it like it is that I heard say recently? Here's what she said, almost a direct quote. My child was born a mongoloid child. Now, God makes us all. And so since God made him this way, I accept his infirmity as God's will. No, if she knew the word of the Lord, and if she believed the word of God, then she would say that child's infirmity is the work of the devil, and then she'd be telling it like it is. Job 1 and 2, sicknesses of the devil, Satan. And in Acts 10, 38, we're told that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Well, obviously, and we know it here, that sickness is an oppression of the devil. And so if she would tell it like it is, she'd say, this is Acts 10, 38, and I'm going to apply to God for healing. Or is this minister telling it like it is when he states, speaking of sodomites and so on, 
that aids that new disease, AIDS, he said, AIDS is not the judgment of God against sodomites. Now, if he would tell it like it is, then he would quote the word of God on the matter, which happens to be, in this case, Romans 1, 26, 27. Listen to it. He says, AIDS is not God's judgment against sodomy. Paul said in Romans 1, 26, 27, For this cause God gave them up, the sodomites and the lesbians, gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly. Now listen and receiving, as a result, receiving in themselves, in their bodies and spirits, that recompense of their error which was meet. To state it in the vernacular, it would be this. They received in themselves the penalty for their perversion. The social diseases, the sexual diseases, gonorrhea and blindness that sometimes results from that, syphilis, herpes, some kinds of incurable AIDS and yet we find that we're living in such a time that the churches are not telling it like it is but we're hearing on the radio we're seeing in the literature more and more how that this is just a different way of expressing one's sexual preference I mean sodomites and lesbians are being admitted in the temple of the Lord both as members and ministers and religious writers are more and more telling us how we are to try to be sympathetic toward and love our gay brother or sister and all of that. Fewer and fewer today are telling it like it is. Because if they tell it like it is, then they'll say, this is an abomination to God. Sodomites and lesbians have no part in the kingdom of God. They can't even enter it. They may sit in a church pew and try to hide it, but they're not in the kingdom. If they'll tell it like it is, they'll tell what God said. And more and more you're going to find, there are already two of them on the scene, that there are diseases that cannot be cured by medical science, and certainly God isn't going to cure them from this perversion that people are engaged in. Now again, are they telling it like it is, in this case the churches, when they do not tell their people the dangers of trusting the arm of the flesh when they need healing? Are the churches telling it like it is, when like the world they're deifying medical science, deifying them and opposing divine healing. Now, if they would tell it like it is, then there are a lot of facts that they would give the people about the dangers of medical science that they're not giving them. Just to mention a few, do the churches point out the hundreds of thousands of infections, maimings and cripplings and killings every year at the hands of medical science? Do they point out the high mortality rate of transplants? No, all you hear is someone got a heart or kidney or some other transplant. But they don't tell you the high mortality rate. It's almost 100% failure, friends. That's how high the mortality rate is. If you can live six months or seven months, they think you're a success. Do they give the adverse effects of all drugs, including aspirin? Do the churches tell you that abortion is murder and that millions of personalities, persons are being murdered every year at the hands of medical science? Do they tell you the pill and planned parenthood to prevent conception is against God's plan for parenthood? Do they tell you, and here's a recent article that someone sent that 41% of those who end up in mental institutions in this survey they made of 215 cases, that 41% of them had been sent there due to a misdiagnosis by the medical profession, and that the ones that were there were sent there because of depression, and the depression was caused by the very drugs that the physicians were giving them. And then after the demons of depression enter, then they can't cope with it, so they send them off to the funny farm. You see that vicious circle? People put their trust, and some of you will still do it. Some of you have already done it. Some of you will still do it. You'll put your trust in the arm of the flesh when the so-called emergency comes, and we've given you 
time after time after time after time the adverse effects of putting yourself in the hands of medical science rather than trusting in the Lord who made your body to begin with and knows how to correct it if anything goes haywire, goes wrong. But you see, they give them the drugs which brings on depression. The drugs open the door to demons which have names by the names of those drugs, which is another story. And so the demons enter, they become more and more depressed or mentally ill, and then they go off to the funny farm. There's no hope, there's no cure, but you can read people's statistics like that, and in their trial, they'll take their baby, or you'll go yourself. And some of you have, some of you will. In spite of the fact that there it is, even they admit themselves that 41% of those sent to that mental institution were there by misdiagnosis. This is why God is raising up in this end time churches like Faith Assembly who will tell it like it is in spite of the slander and the ridicule and the persecution by both the secular and religious worlds and the media. In spite of the fact that we have people, well-known ministers, building charismatic hospitals. In spite of the fact that most charismatic ministers teach their followers to go to the doctor because that's what they do themselves. I'm saying if they would tell it like it is, they'd tell them that they're risking their lives to put themselves in the hands of medical science. And there are doctors who will tell you that. If you want to read their literature, it's available. The worst place to go, they say, is to a doctor when you're sick or to the hospital. And you can answer the question of why people can sit under that teaching for years and still go, because people have, and I've said they still will. Well, let's look at faith. That's healing. We said telling it like it is is to proclaim the full gospel. Whatever God has to say about faith or healing or whatever, we don't water it down, regardless of the cost, and certainly it's costly. We've learned that. Our ministers telling it like it is who teach that the exercise of faith in the written promise of God is presumption, that you need a rhema from heaven, a special word from God that you can't go by the written word, which they call a logos, that you have to get that special revelation from heaven, rhema, to confirm that the logos, the written word, is for you, say you need healing for that time, that ailment, it's God's will, and if it is, he'll give you the gift of faith. Are they telling it like it is? No, if they told it like it is, then they would admit there's no such distinction between those two words in the New Testament. You see, that's manology to explain why they don't have the faith for healing or anything else, why they are afraid to trust God and not the doctors. If they told it like it is, they'd say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. If they told it like it is, they would say that Jesus said, it's according to your faith if you want to be healed. And they say, it's not according to your faith. It's according to whether or not you get a special revelation. Again, are those ministers who teach, thank God for everything, telling it like it is? Or is that some perversion, subtle perversion of the true word of God? You're to thank God for the cancer, for the divorce, for the fact that you're child is a drug addict and on and on. You'll get what you confess. You start thanking God, you think you're thanking God anyway, for the cancer, that's what you'll die of. Like the minister's wife I read about developed cancer and she had swallowed, she and her husband, minister husband had swallowed that deception, thank God for everything. I guess you already know, but now it's thank God in everything, claim the victory, through a promise of God and thank him in the trial that he's faithful and all that, but you don't thank him for the cancer as she did. And someone said, don't you want that thing healed? Don't you want to be healed, us to pray for you? She said, no, I just want God's will to be done. And she died thinking she was doing God's will. And in another case, these were missionaries when a wife's husband was captured by the communists and he had taught her to say that, though she never did understand it. Thank God for everything. When the communists came in and hauled him off, she never knew if she'd see him again. She fell on her knees and said, Lord, I don't understand it, but I thank you that the communists have captured my husband. And then she waited for almost a decade and a half for his return, waited in that land for the communists to give him back. She never saw him alive again. In fact, she never saw him again. In other words, she was confessing her fate, not her faith, to thank God that her husband had been captured. How could you release faith if you're thanking God for the fact that that's happened? No way, of course, you know the answer. 
Now, the average minister has no more faith in the world out there. They worry. They confess the negative. In that same book I was reading about the capture of the missionaries, just before the capture came, the communists were bombing that area. And they were moving down to where they were going to eventually take the whole area. But they were bombing, and so they had a concrete bomb shelter. And the whole family rushed in there. And one of the little children, five or six years old, as they were enduring that bombing, kept saying, I hope the enemy doesn't get us. I hope the communists do not come. I hope the enemy does not get us. And he would say that over and over until the father, the minister, the missionary, said, Son, will you please be quiet and let the adults do the worrying? Now, that's such a common expression. That's why I didn't hear an O oh or an Amen or anything, because that's what people say all the time. The adults are supposed to do the worrying not realizing that he's a minister, a missionary. He should be talking faith, not that we're going to do the worrying. Well, if this confession lines up with the Word of God, then somewhere I've gotten a hold of the wrong Bible. Does this line up with the Word? Listen to this. Or does it sound like humanistic philosophical reasoning? The idea that failure and defeat equals victory, which is a contradiction, but... Statements like this that I've picked up in my reading. Succeeding is not nearly as important as trying. Now, dear friends, succeeding is 10,000 light years more important than trying. Right. Trying isn't faith. You don't try to get healed. You won't get healed trying to get healed. People always are coming up for prayer trying to get the victory, trying to get healed, trying to get the Holy Spirit. You don't try if it's faith. Succeeding is is not nearly as important as trying? Where do you find that verse in the Bible? Or this statement, it's better to strike out than never to swing a bat. <laughs> you hear that all the time. In fact, it's so commonplace to you, you have to sit there and think about it. I can tell in my spirit. You have to sit there and think about it. Well, what's wrong with that? I've always heard, at least the man tried. It's better to strike out than never to have swung a bat. Friends, it's worthless and useless to swing a bat and strike out. That's just beating the air. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says, I don't beat the air just fanning away with my arms, but I bring my body under the discipline of the Word of God. Amen. Why, that's the most foolish statement, and everybody buys statements like that, Christians and non-Christians alike, that it's better to strike out. It isn't better to strike out. It's better to succeed than to strike out. That's what you're up there to bat for. That's what you're walking this faith walk for. It's to succeed, not to strike out. And yet everybody receives that. Or this one, failure is the back door to success. I guess that's why there's so many back there at the back door. <laughs> because they've been taught that and they lap that up like a cat drinking cream because this seems to be a way out of their dilemma, why they're always failing. Failure is just the back door to success and they'll stay back there at the back door. They'll never get to the front door. I'm going to start at the front door. I don't know about you. Or this statement, I did the will of God, but I failed. But obedience is better than success. Now, dear friends, that sounds pious to an untrained ear. That may sound like you're glorifying God, but that is not Bible. I did the will of God and failed. You can't fail doing the will of God. You're always a success. Now, if you mean you didn't succeed and make a million dollars or succeed in some fleshly or carnal way, that's another matter. But you always succeed when you do the will of God. Obedience is better than success. Now, where did you ever find that if you take the first part of that statement with it? I did the will of God. People like that should read this passage, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. Now, where do you find that there's any failure in Christ? Then secondly, we said that telling it like it is what it is, it means to proclaim and witness to a full gospel without any compromise. Secondly, telling it like it is means to tell the truth at all times, at all costs. Now, you may be surprised how many people do not tell the truth. We have dealt in more than one instance with half-truths, white lies, implications that something is true that isn't, and so on. But telling it like it is means you'll tell the truth. If you're going to overcome, you'll tell the truth. But too many follow the philosophy in religious matters. They follow the philosophy of a German philosopher named Hegel, H-E-G-E-L, Hegel. When someone pointed out to him 
that his beliefs didn't line up with the facts. They said, your beliefs about such and such a matter do not line up with the facts. Hegel replied, then so much the worse for the facts. And a lot of people are that way. I was reading a book. The author was dealing with a contemporary minister, popular, well-known minister. And the author said, concerning this minister, he exaggerates the results of his campaigns and crusades. For example, the author said, the number of people saved, the number of people healed, the number of people who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit were exaggerated. In fact, one well-known minister died by his own admission because he could not tell the truth about the statistics of his meetings. So he don't want to fall into that snare. He said on his deathbed, I'm being chastened by the Lord because I could never tell the truth about the results of the meetings. He said if 300 were saved, I told it to 600. If 500 got healed, 1,500 got healed. If 80 received the Holy Spirit, it was 280 and so forth. And he said, God's allowing this chastening to take my life because I never learned to tell the truth. I'm saying telling it like it is means you're going to tell the truth. And this author went on to say about this person that his contributions that he gets, that he says are for the spreading of the gospel, a part of it, and this author implied a large part, went for personal enjoyment. You know, some people equate their religious empires that they're building with the gospel. But anyway, things are not always what they seem to be. When ministers are telling you, send in your money and we're going to use it for this and not a penny will be spent for that and so forth and so on. And as this author was pointing out, this well-known minister hasn't always been truthful about that. We get some money for radio broadcasts. We never ask for a penny, as you know. And some people send some in. Generally, over a year, it's not enough to pay for one broadcast, but it's still several thousand dollars. And every penny that is marked, whenever a check or a letter says for radio broadcasts, dear friends, that goes on a special page in our books in the office. And every penny of that is spent for nothing else but radio broadcasts. And so if you're going to tell it like it is, then you're going to have to be truthful. Eventually, liars are going to get caught anyway. Liars are eventually caught, whether they're talking about doggy bags or ministers' brags. You say, what's that? Well, eventually, people who do not tell the truth are going to get caught. I read about the minister took his little daughter and wife out to eat, and at the end of the meal, they couldn't eat all of the meat and so forth, so he called the waitress over and asked for a doggy bag. And the little five-year-old said, oh, goody, Daddy, are we going to get a doggy? doggy bags to ministers brags one well-known minister said as he was in conference with the president of the united states this happened recently and he was boasting you see ministers brags he was boasting about what the president confided to him and the president went public and denied it all you see so there's a well-known minister who lied and how did he handle that well he said well you know under the pressure of the circumstances sometimes things get a little bit out of focus or whatever. Dear friends, if you're going to be an overcomer, there's one thing you have to do is tell the truth to your husband, to your wife, and to yourself. Now, while telling the truth sometimes will get you into trouble, nevertheless, in the long run, it's going to be the best for you. There are times when telling the truth can get you out of trouble, just being honest with yourself. I read of a man who was during World War II, applied for a position in a country, by the way, he spoke several languages, he applied for a position in this particular country, he spoke their language and could write it, and several of the firms wrote back and said they had no opening. In fact, he said one wrote back and said, we not only don't have an opening, you're misinformed, but you write terrible. And then he named the language. He says, you write our language in a very poor fashion. So it's presumptuous for you to try to apply for a job in a country where you don't speak the language well. And he said his first reaction was to be angry about this. And then he got to thinking, well, perhaps he's right. How can I ever expect to work in this country and be an efficient go-between between this country and others if I can't speak their language well? And so rather than getting upset, he said, I wrote the manufacturer back and I thanked him for taking time to read my letter and I was sorry that I was misinformed about the nature of his business and he didn't need a representative. 
as they say today, rep didn't need a representative, and he said, moreover, I want to thank you for pointing out how poor my grammar was, that I didn't realize that I didn't speak it or write it any better than that, and I want to thank you for putting me on the road to self-improvement in learning your language better. And as a result of that, to make a long story short or short story long, whichever, the manufacturer wrote him back and invited him in for an interview and then employed him, hired him. So being honest, you see, about yourself and about matters, being truthful, can work in your favor. Sometimes it'll cause you problems, but you'll never regret it. Then also being truthful means that we must distinguish between confessing the negative about ourselves and being honest and truthful with ourselves. I mean, you're not being negative but truthful to yourself if the pastor's message tonight, for example, has your name and address on it and you're honest with yourself and you admit it, or any message for that matter, or if he's counseling with you and what he says where you need an area to correct, that you admit that. You don't try to justify yourself, as most do. I'll tell you, friends, counseling is not easy because you have to wade through all of the reasons why people don't want to change the reason for why they've got the problem. So be honest and truthful with yourself. It isn't being negative, but truthful if you admit that you acted like a hysterical woman when you berated your husband when he ran through a red light accidentally and almost had an accident. You see, truth and honesty will help you to learn how to control your tongue. If you admit that you have the problem just because he did something that didn't please you, you see, is no reason for berating your husband. However, to turn the coin over, if men are honest, they will admit that women have a lot less accidents than men, that men take more chances in their driving than the women do. The statistics show this, that women are safer drivers. I don't know if they're safer, but they're more cautious. They drive over by the curb where nothing's happening. You ever see two of them come to an intersection? And which one is to go first? Are four at a four-way stop? I'll tell you, friends. You might as well camp out. <laughs> I'm saying they are more cautious. They have less accidents. I don't know if they're safer drivers, but they have less accidents. And you find four come to a four-way stop, and one will wave the other one on. The other one, no, you go <laughs> over here. And then one of them will look down in her purse like she has to find something right away before she can go. And another will all of a sudden discover some pedestrians walking along and maybe somebody she knows. So she watches them, hoping somebody will go before them. Well, they are more cautious. The Reader's Digest article proved that. A woman was riding a bus and it was so crowded the driver couldn't see by the door. They were standing in the aisles and down by the door so he couldn't see out the right side door and he came to the intersection and stopped and when it was time to go the light had changed or whatever he said to the woman is it clear can I go now the woman standing right by the door he couldn't see out it can I go she hesitated and she said well my husband would but I wouldn't <laughs> and so <laughs> if we're honest men we'll admit they have less accidents then it isn't being negative but truthful if you admit to yourself, now we're talking to the ministers, if you admit to yourself that you stand in the pulpit and you tell others how to live, you encourage them to have faith, you tell them you can do all things through Christ, and yet as ministers sometimes you allow yourself to get tense and upset over circumstances, counseling or whatever. As one minister that I was reading how he overcame, he said he overcame this problem by watching his wife wash dishes. You might wonder why, but he said he noticed she never washed yesterday's dishes today. She never tried to wash tomorrow's dishes today. She only washed today's dishes, and she washed them one at a time. And so he said he applied that, Matthew 6.34, if you don't know where that's found, he applied that to his ministry, where he just dealt with one problem, one member, one whatever at a time. And so Matthew 6.34 says to live just a day at a time. So not only will we help ourselves by being honest with ourselves, but if we are truthful and honest and tell it like it is, we can also help others. Let me give you two examples. 
in conclusion tonight, of how, by telling it like it is, you can help others. Take the matter, guess what, sodomite shoes. That is a good example, and I'll show you why. Now, I never knew anything about them being sodomite shoes, the sodomites wearing them and making them popular, and then the straights took them up like everything else the sodomites wear, from bomber jackets to white duck overalls painters overalls for dress they go out on dates this way and Easter parades but anyway I didn't know they were sodomite shoes until I read in a leading news magazine they were and so I just knew I didn't like them when I discovered they cost 50 60 70 dollars or more I couldn't believe it I wouldn't waste 10 cents on the ugliest looking things that I've ever seen but I didn't know they were sodomite shoes and when I learned they were, then that was two reasons why I didn't want them. And so I shared that in our studies on divine order and the family and that God is concerned about how we dress and how we look and how we talk and where we work and all of that. And I was aware that some didn't take it seriously. They weren't too impressed with the fact that there were sodomite shoes. They kept wearing them, even buying them for their little kids. But that isn't new in faith assembly or anywhere else. It seems to take a while so that truth will soak in by osmosis or something and people will start practicing what you preach. Well anyway, to make a long story short again, a woman wrote how that she was suffering oppressing dreams, very unedifying dreams and she said, of course she didn't make the connection at that time, but that her husband had several pairs of sodomite shoes and the Lord showed her eventually that as long as you're disobeying the light you've got, whether it's sodomite shoes or whatever, friends, then you've got a door open to oppression, whether it's physical, financial, domestic, or whatever. You may not know those quarrels you're having between husband and wife are related to something that you're disobeying God about where he's given you light. And so when they saw, when the Holy Spirit showed there was connection, when they saw that, he gladly threw the shoes away, and as a result, she was delivered from those oppressing dreams from that day forward. Now, my point in telling that is, I've got a question. How in the world would she have ever known in 10,000 years what was causing her oppression if I had neglected to tell it like it is on just a subject of shoes that the sodomites wear? You can believe me, it's a lot easier to leave some subjects alone because you become an object of ridicule, you're accused of legalism, and on and on. You know the story. It's a lot easier, but you can't live with yourself, not if you're a minister of the Lord. And so we dealt with it. As a result, she got delivered. Now you tell me, if I'd listen to people that get offended when you point out things that they don't want to give up, how in the world would she have ever gotten delivered from that oppression? Take another example. We are repeatedly receiving praise of the Lord for those tapes exposing the neo-discipleship cult, the shepherdship cult, that bondage. Over and over, letters and people, when they speak to you and so forth, tell you how they were delivered from that bondage, got their eyes open by those tapes. My point is, if I had listened to some people, my critics, some in this church when we were in the other building, a minister who used to attend here who said, oh, you should not criticize those great men of God, even if they are wrong. And if I had listened to people like that, to, I think I mentioned last Wednesday, a man at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Meeting where I was speaking, the last one who came, said, you're 90% wrong about these shepherdship teachers. If I had listened to a pastor's wife who came all the way down to straighten me out on these shepherdship teachers, they're great men of God, the reason she came, her husband was going to come to straighten me out, but he dropped dead of a heart attack the day before he was going to come and tell me like it is. Well, you see, I didn't listen to any of those any more than Jeremiah did to his critics, and as a result, there have been multitudes of people set free because I was willing to tell it like it is and suffer the ridicule and the criticism, misunderstandings. Well, dear friends, we could just multiply the examples of how people are being helped because we are willing to tell it like it is, whether it's about healing, neo-discipleship, the JDS heresy, or whatever. Amen. Father, bless the word to the hearts of the people. May they have open hearts, not only to receive but perceive what the Spirit is speaking to our hearts about tonight, that we are to be faithful witnesses to the word in every respect, not watering down or compromising 
not changing one jot or tittle to please either self or others, but to speak the truth in love. And as a result, be truly an overcomer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.